My name is Kelly Hicks, and today we're going to talk about the concept of sexuality, and we're going to focus on sexually transmitted diseases. The objectives of this module are to examine the pathophysiology and clinical manifestations of sexually transmitted diseases, analyze laboratory and diagnostic testing related to sexually transmitted diseases, utilize pharmacological interventions in caring for clients experiencing sexually transmitted diseases, and recognize the importance of prevention in decreasing the incidence of sexually transmitted diseases. First of all, let's talk about sexually transmitted infections, STIs, versus sexually transmitted diseases, STDs. Um, STIs, STDs, and VD, or venereal disease, are terms that in the general population are used very interchangeably. STD is probably the most common term used, and this is why the CDC actually uses this term, as they realize that people are more familiar with this term. There was an article in Joggin that did a, a survey among people and their thoughts on the term. And again, STD was a more familiar term to most people. However, most of the healthcare providers actually differentiate STIs or sexually transmitted infections as curable and STDs or sexually transmitted diseases as incurable. And if you think about that, that makes sense. We can cure an infection. We might not necessarily be able to cure a disease. And also I've included a chart that you can read on um, some different statistics related to STDs. For the purpose of this module, I will probably refer to STDs and STIs as interchangeable, and I will let you know which ones are curable and which ones are not. First one we're going to talk about is trichomonas. This is a curable um, disease. It's caused by trichomonas vaginalis, which is a single cell protozoan parasite. This can actually cause pregnant women to go into preterm labor. So we need to get this diagnosed and treated quickly in all women, both pregnant and not pregnant. Signs and symptoms in women, there's going to be heavy yellow, green, or gray, frothy, or bubbly discharge, dyspareunia, which is painful sex. There may also be colpitis macularis, which is the strawberry look of the cervix. And men who have trichomonas are usually asymptomatic. To diagnose this, they'll take some of the discharge and put it on a slide and do a visualization under the microscope on a wet, wet mount, and it will look very similar to the picture on the slide. Also, if the woman has a vaginal pH of greater than 4.5, this is usually an indication of trichomonas. Treatment for this, we're going to give the clients flagell. We're going to give them a single two gram dose. This is usually only given to non-pregnant clients as flagell can generally um, cause some risk to the pregnant client. It puts them at risk for preterm labor and low birth weight babies. However, they have decided that the use of this medication um, is okay in pregnant women because the benefits of the treatment outweigh their risks. So usually all individuals are treated with flagell. Anyone taking flagell needs to avoid alcohol when taking as it has some of the same side effects as antabuse, which is a medication that makes you severely, severely sick if you do drink alcohol. So no alcohol with this medication. Both partners will need to be treated when there is a diagnosis of trichomonas in one of the clients. Nursing considerations, you need to educate the clients to refrain from sex until both partners have completely taken all the medication and are symptom free. Bacterial vaginosis, or BV, is the next one. This is caused by Gardnerella vaginalis, which is a gram-negative bacillus. Signs and symptoms are generally a thin, white, fishy-smelling discharge. To diagnose this, we're usually going to have, again, a vaginal pH of greater than 4.5. They're going to put this discharge on a slide, and there will be presence of clue cells on a wet mount. 
There will also be a positive with test, which is where they take a drop of 10% potassium hydroxide, they mix it with the discharge, and it produces a very fishy smell. And these are all ways to diagnose BV. The treatment of this is oral flagell or clindamycin cream. Treatment is only for females because there has been no benefit found in treating males as far as treatment in males preventing reoccurrence, so it's not recommended to treat the males. They only treat the female. Um, nursing considerations, prevention, and responsible sexual behavior, which we'll talk about more in depth towards the end of this presentation. The next disease we're going to talk about is chlamydia. It's caused by chlamydia trachomatis, which is an intracellular parasite. This is one of the most common bacterial STIs in the United States. This is a treatable disease. Signs and symptoms, usually both men and women are asymptomatic, but women can show symptoms both in the cervix and in the urinary tract, and the men also in the urinary tract. There can be thin or purulent discharge, burning and frequent urination, and lower abdominal pain. To diagnose, they will take a culture of the discharge from the penis or the cervix, or a urine specimen can also be tested. To treat chlamydia, there's a couple different things that can treat it. Zithromax, single one gram dose orally. This is ideal for pregnant clients. Doxycycline, 100 milligrams PO twice daily for seven days. This is contraindicated in clients that are pregnant. Doxycycline is not recommended for pregnant clients. Both uh, the male and the female must be treated, both partners. And because of the frequency of co-infections with gonorrhea, there may also be a combination regimen used. It could be ceftrioxone, which is rocephin, with doxycycline or azithromycin, which are prescribed for, again, co-infections with gonorrhea because gonorrhea and chlamydia are buddies and most of the time if someone's infected with one they have the other. Next we've got gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is also known as the clap. That's a slang term for it. It's caused by uh, Neisseria gonorrhea which is an aerobic gram-negative intracellular diplococcus. Signs and symptoms in men they usually have dysuria, serous, milky, or purulent discharge from the penis. Women are generally asymptomatic, but they can also have dysuria, urinary frequency, vaginal discharge, and dyspareunia. For the diagnosis of this, they're going to do a culture from the infected mucous membranes and do a gram stain. To treat gonorrhea, we're gonna, we can do a couple different things. We can do Suprex, 400 milligrams orally in a single dose. Rosephin, 125 milligrams IM in a single dose. And again, both partners must be treated. If this is left, left untreated, it can lead to PID, which is pelvic inflammatory disease, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, another thing that can happen if some, a woman has gonorrhea and delivers, it can actually be transmitted to the baby and given uh, to the baby and causes blindness. So erythromycin eye ointment is administered to newborns to prevent transmission and subsequent blindness. Again, for nursing considerations, prevention, and responsible sexual behavior. Herpes simplex virus, or HSV, um, it is caused by HSV-1 and HSV-2. As most of you know, HSV-1 is usually found on the mouth. It's usually in the form of a cold sore or a fever blister and HSV-2 is generally genital herpes. I do want to point out though that 10% of genital herpes is caused by HSV-1. And the reason that that happens if, is that someone can have a fever blister and if oral sex is performed, then that is how HSV-1 can cause genital herpes. Any contact with mucous membranes or breaking the skin can cause transmission, and transmission can occur even without an active outbreak. There are many people that think they can only transmit it if there's an active outbreak, and that is not the case. It can be transmitted 
even without a without a outbreak. One out of every six people have this. This is a, another common disease. Signs and symptoms include multiple painful vesicular lesions, mucopurulent discharge, headache, fever, and malaise. Now, in order to treat this, there's some different medications that can be used. But when I refer to treatment, we're treating the symptoms. This is an incurable disease. Once you have it, you have it forever. We just try to manage outbreaks and manage the pain that comes with the outbreaks. So for treatment, we can do Zovirax, 400 milligrams, TID orally for 7 to 10 days. We can also do Valtrex, 1 gram BID orally for 7 to 10 days. Valtrex is also your treatment of choice whenever we think about suppression. Suppression therapy is recommended for individuals with six or more reoccurrences in one year. And pregnant women also need to begin treatment at 36 weeks and continue until delivery in order to suppress an outbreak so that they can have a vaginal delivery. If at the time of delivery there is an active outbreak, the woman must have a C-section as to not transmit the disease to the baby. Some nursing considerations, no sex during active outbreaks, and also there need to be precautions taken um, whenever there's not an outbreak is it can still be transmitted so condoms are going to be a big thing for people with herpes. Also they need to be educated on the fact that outbra outbreaks are related to stress so the more stress you have the more frequent your outbreaks are going to occur. Human papillomavirus, or HPV, is the next disease we're going to talk about. This is uh, one of the most common STDs out there. There's more than 120 strains noted. For signs and symptoms, most of the time the men are usually asymptomatic, and this is part of the reason why it is so common, because so many men have HPV, uh, they don't know that they have it, and then they pass it along to their partner. HPV can also cause genital warts or the condylomata. These are the cauliflower-like lesions on the genital area. Not all strains result in genital warts, and there are some strains of HPV that cause cervical cancer. So when we talk about diagnosis, obviously if there's someone with genital warts with the, the condylomata all over their genital area, that would be an obvious indicator of the HPV. Um, in women, a pap smear can be done because, again, a woman can, have, can also have HPV and it be asymptomatic and it not be a strain that causes warts. But because of the risk for cervical cancer, it's so important that women follow up and get those annual pap smears. Um, cervical dysplasia could be noted on a pap smear and that may be the symptom of the certain strains of HPV that do not cause the warts and um, at that point they may have to do a colposcopy which is where they remove a piece of the cervix that does have the dysplasia or the LEAP procedure may be done to further investigate and that's where they remove the entire top layer of the cells from the cervix and this can determine whether or not there is cervical cancer. Colposcopies and LEAPs are both diagnostic and treatment methods. In order to treat, um, again, if there is a virus, then there's really no treatment if there's no symptoms. In order to treat this, basically what they're going to do is treat the warts if they're present. There's a topical therapy that can be done. Podophyllin is a topical therapy, but it's not to be used in pregnancy. Then there's also the tri- Chloroacetic acid that can be done, and also cryotherapy can remove the warts. A big thing here we need to talk about is prevention. There's actually now the Gardasil vaccination that's out. It is also recommended for boys and girls now. Before it was just girls, now it's boys and girls between the ages of 9 to 26 per, uh, for prevention. 
there are three IM injections over six months. They get the initial injection. Two months after that, they get the second and the third one six months after the initial. This, however, only vaccinates against certain strains of HPV, so it's kind of like the flu vaccine. It doesn't vaccinate against all of them. But again, the big thing to remember is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So it's good to at least vaccinate against the strains that it does protect against. Here is a picture of genital warts in both the female and male. Now let's talk about syphilis. Syphilis is caused by Treponema pallatum. It is a spirochete. The transmission of syphilis is um, through sex. It's through contact with open wounds or infected blood, and it can also be transmitted through the placenta during pregnancy. So the fetal um, transmission of congenital syphilis usually can result in some of the following, spontaneous abortion, prematurity, stillbirth, multisystem failure, and mental retardation. Signs and symptoms, there are different stages of syphilis, there's different types of syphilis, and we'll go through all those. And I'll explain to you why I think that syphilis is one of the most scary diseases out there. The primary syphilis, it starts with a canker that develops at the site where the organism entered the body. It then disappears in one to six weeks if there's no treatment. If it's in one of those spots on a person that they're not familiar with, they don't look at a lot, they don't normally see, then it may go unnoticed and then one to six weeks later it's going to disappear. However, during this time period where the canker is, they're going to have some fever, they're going to have malaise, weight loss, those kinds of things. Then we move on to secondary syphilis. If it's left untreated two weeks to six months after that canker disappears, then they may know a skin rash, especially on the palms of their hands and the bottom of their feet, and they're going to have flu-like symptoms. This stage can actually last two years. Again, if they still haven't figured out that they have syphilis, it can move on to the latent stage. Two or more years after initial infection, and this can last up to 50 years. This is where the person is asymptomatic, but they can still transmit it. This phase or stage right here is the reason why I think syphilis is the scariest disease is because the person who has it doesn't know they have it and they could be um, in a sexual relationship with their partner and the partner doesn't know they have it and then again if you don't know you have something you can't get it treated so that's why this is pretty scary ultimately again if it is left untreated it's gonna turn into tertiary syphilis which where it spreads to other body systems and can cause irreversible damage a lot of elderly people in the past have had problems with dementia or Alzheimer's and whenever they go to the doctor they do some tests and they realize that it's not really dementia or Alzheimer's it's really syphilis that has been undetected become tertiary syphilis and caused irreversible damage to their brain um, to diagnose syphilis is actually one simple little blood test um, two different labs can be done. One is called the VDRL, which is Venereal Disease Research Lab, or RPR, Rapid Plasma Reagent. Either of these can be used to test for syphilis. Treatment. The ironic thing about syphilis is that if treated in the primary stage, all it takes is 2.4 million units of benzathine penicillin G IM in a single dose. So all it takes is one little dose of penicillin to cure the primary syphilis. However, if it's been longer than one year or if there's been an unknown duration of syphilis, it's going to be treated with the same dose, the 2.4 million units of penicillin weekly for three weeks. And again, that's going to be IM. For penicillin allergies, doxycycline or tetracycline can be given orally for primary syphilis, but again, if they don't know they have it and it's been untreated for a while, the CDC has actually um, decided that the best thing to do is penicillin desensitization and treat those people with penicillin as well. 
PID, or pelvic inflammatory disease, is the next disease that we're going to talk about. This is an inflammatory disorder of the upper female genital tract that includes any combination of endometritis, salpingitis, tubo-ovarian abscess, pelvic abscess, or pelvic perinitis. This is, uh, again, an inflammatory response that can be caused by gonorrhea and chlamydia are the most frequent causes. Uh, bacterial vaginosis can also cause it. But basically, any STD that's left untreated can spread up into the female genital tract and cause PID. Signs and symptoms include bilateral sharp cramping in the lower quadrants, fever, chills, purulent vaginal drainage, irregular bleeding, malaise, and nausea vomiting. However, some women can even be asymptomatic. As you can see on the slide here, the normal ovary on the one side and the inflamed ovary and the inflamed fallopian tube on the other side. So you can see how this would be very painful. To diagnose, they're going to do a CBC. They're also going to go ahead and test for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis and other STDs to see if there's any that have been left untreated. They're going to do a pelvic exam. They're going to look for a palpable mass. And they're also going to do an ultrasound to confirm. To treat this, they may hospitalize the woman and give her IV antibiotics. They can give her cefetitan or cefoxetin plus doxycycline or clindamycin plus genomycin. Um, so those are the spectrum of antibiotics that they're going to give her in the hospital. However, if treated on the outpatient basis, they're going to do ceftrioxone plus doxycycline, and they may add flagyl or they may just do ceftrioxone and doxycycline. The woman can become infertile as a result of PID if this is left untreated. Now let's talk about some nursing considerations. When you look at Healthy People 2020, they are focusing big on STDs. They're talking about uh, behavioral counseling to prevent sexually transmitted infections, how to screen for it, and things like that. The biggest thing we need to do is to talk about education. We need to educate our clients. What are sexually transmitted diseases? How are they transmitted? Believe it or not, there are a lot of people that do not quite understand how sexually transmitted diseases are transmitted. They don't understand what sexually transmitted diseases are, and some people think that if they're a curable disease, does it really matter? All I can do is take some antibiotic and it'll be gone. So we really need to educate them on what it can do, you know, what that it could lead to infertility and that they might not be concerned about having a family right now if they're young, if they're teenagers, or, you know, just unmarried people, but that eventually one day they may want to have a family and they might not be able to because of some of the decisions that they made when they were younger. The big thing, again, for education, we want to talk about prevention. Abstinence, of course, is the only 100% surefire way of ensuring that you will not get a sexually transmitted disease. However, we as nurses need to be realistic in the fact that we need to just focus more on responsible sexual behavior. We need to help them work on reducing the number of sexual partners they have, getting tested prior to entering a sexual relationship, the importance of using condoms, the importance of using other contraception because sexually transmitted diseases are not the only thing that can occur from a sexual relationship. Pregnancy can also occur. And also, we need to educate on early detection and treatment. The biggest thing is they need to seek medical attention immediately if they suspect that they have some type of sexually transmitted disease. They also really need to inform their sexual partner that they have a sexual transmitted diseases and get that partner treated to prevent reinfection. Because if one of the partners has a STD, they get treated and the other partner doesn't, and they have sex again, that person is just going to be reinfected with the same STD. The CDC has actually been working on something for the past several years called Expedited Partner Therapy, or EPT. Basically what this says is that it gives the right to um, health care providers to write prescriptions 
for both the person that comes in and tests positive for an STD and then also to give them an extra prescription to send home for their partner in order for their partner to be treated without being seen. This is not something that is approved in all states. It is approved in North Carolina and some states have not gotten on board because there are a lot of things that need to be considered whenever doing that. Whenever you're writing a prescription for somebody, what if they have allergies and you're writing them a prescription to something they're allergic to? Um, those are some reasons why not all states have got on board with the expedited partner treatment. Or excuse me, expedited partner therapy. Also, another education piece for the females is that if you do get treated for an STD, a lot of the antibiotics that the women are placed on are going to cause them to have a yeast infection and they need to understand that and they need to take all that medicine and they may need to go back to the doctor to get something to treat that yeast infection. The end of this module includes some questions in NCLEX format for you to practice your knowledge of STDs after this module. Thank you. The end of this module includes some questions in NCLEX format for you to practice your knowledge of STDs after this module. Thank you.